Don't come to this yellow one with a red for land of war. I want to thank the yellow one for leadership for allowing us to be this morning. I served in the military for more than 38 years. And after numerous deployments, I've seen the best and worst of humanity. However, there continues to be numerous challenges we experience together. We are all survivors of the COVID 19 pandemic. We work on the point of Ukraine conflict, civil unrest, and skyrocketing living expenses. Through these challenges, we will remain resilient, guardians of freedom and justice, our nation's sole achievement. However, protecting this great nation does take its toll on some of our enemies, their families, and friends to the point of not sustaining in this progressive race called life. The race is twofold. A life duration and B development. When we share our experiences and available resources, we encourage others to develop. Which is the topic of our presentation? When the race it means rise above challenges every day. I am using the word every day as an adjective, meaning routine or commonplace. I am saying how I will use the word every day when we use in my presentation because I don't want to short circuit my English majors sending out the audience. Challenges don't come every day, but when it does, hopefully something that I've said in this presentation with the five points I'm going to identify will help someone in the audience rise above. I'm on a numerous appointments, and here is what I really love. A tent can be so small and so big at the same time during the points. It was small because others were in tent with you, and it was a continuous struggle for space. At night, you can hear very volumes of snoring, teeth grinding, and occasionally hear someone saying how much they miss home. After a few days, I got used to it and learned this week after working 12 to 20 hour days. I learned to sleep on the concrete in a gas tank around at the taxiways, in the dirt, in vehicles, on top of the vehicles, underneath the vehicles, and all types of weather, even during a typhoon because it took three days of Passover and it knocked over the tent stand. The tent became so big when I tuned out sound effects and the environment out. I began to be alone in my thoughts. I was at an impasse. I wanted to go home to see if everybody was all right, but I didn't want to go home because I knew the deployment changed me. I discovered after every deployment, I left a part of me that was there and incorporated something that was there. I was so deep in my thoughts that the tent became the size of a football field. And every time I was thinking about how I was deciding, how I was going to make the decision, how to address my family, it was either time to go back to work, and eventually I ran out of time to come back home. So, on one flight back home, I came up with a master plan. 
I said, what I'm going to do is make a couple of doctor visits to everybody is doing, and then I'm going to keep it moving and just stay away. Um, when I got home, I've seen everybody was all right, the doctor visit plan was working, but after a couple of days, they unknowingly started getting on my nerves. Yes, and there was a little bit um, taking food for granted, talking a lot, to me having little or no sense of urgency, uh, complaining about what needs to be fixed in their house. When I know some people overseas will just kill for a space and a blanket on the floor, I would smile, but deep down inside, it was a quiet storm. I kept my distance and act like I had some place to go or something else to do. My family knew something was wrong, and they asked me several times, but I wouldn't tell them because I surmised. It was a military thing, and they wouldn't understand. And I never forget this. My mother, one day she was cooking, and she didn't say anything the whole time they were alive. And she was uh, cooking some food. She said, Son, when are you going to come back home? And it hit and it hurt. And I realized. I've not only been lying to my family, I've been lying to myself. I realized I needed help bridging the gap between deployments and coming back home. The other women didn't exist back then, so I had to get creative and build a network of friends and some family members who were part of the military to help me practice situational awareness. It took a few months. And after a lot of practice, it worked, and I rose above that challenge. I discovered many military members had the same challenges I did. Um, an observation is this. Everyone changes, not only the person who deploys, but also the person who stays back on the company as well. So my main point, when it breaks point number one, it's all right to change, but don't disengage. It's all right to change, but don't disengage. Sometimes the race start off so easy and get challenging along the way. I easily completed my doctoral academic classes and thought my dissertation process was going to be easy. I bought my $700 carrier, I laid it out, I was practicing walking and everything else before I even submitted my chapters. My dissertation phase was a combination between the Twilight Zone, Creep Show, Good Times, and The Wizard of Oz. In my dissertation phase, it took me almost two years to write a proposal to do research totaling 157 pages. I was getting ready to submit my proposal like that man in the twilight zone after he survived the nuclear blast. you remember that? And all he wanted to do was sit down there and read his book. And when he got to himself to read his book, what happened? He stepped on his glasses and he couldn't read. Well, I had my chapters and everything done, getting ready to submit to my mentor and my committee, and my mentor quit along with one committee member, so I had nobody to submit my dissertation to, my proposal. It took another four months for me to find a committee. The new committee did not like my proposal, so they made me do a lot of revisions, a lot of changes. It went on more than 20 times. I felt like that it was awful and annoying. It, I felt like um, that show, Creep Show, where the lady, after she hit the, hit, uh, hit the hitchhiker, he kept coming back saying, Thank the ride, lady. Thank the ride, lady. 
it was that annoying to me. Momentum with committee members approved my proposal after we reviewed the process, sent it over to the academic dean. Two weeks went by, I heard nothing. Two more weeks went by, I heard nothing. Two more weeks went by, I heard nothing. And then one Saturday, I was at my office working, I got a call from Dr. Tabor. He said, uh, all right, I, I got something to tell you. I was already, like I told you earlier, I was already prepared. I'm going to walk the stage and ready. He said, the day is not going to accept their proposal as it, because she felt like it was more a social issue than a work environment issue. He said, you're going to have to either rewrite a major part of it, or you're going to have to start all over again. I'm very quiet. Because you know sometimes when you get so mad, you just have to go to the empty spot. And you just wait for a while because you don't want to say the wrong thing. Well, that's exactly what I did. And then he said something about like said, Eric. I know you're going to do some time with yourself. Don't quit. But if you hold on, you'll eventually get through the process. I hung up the phone. It was quiet. We had a big building. That you can walk around the outside. I must have walked around that building a hundred times. And I put in my mind a thousand times. I said, I'm done. But then I thought about my college tuition bill again. <laughs> Nothing to show for it but a rude deal. I thought about this quote that I found online, and it was by Roger Crawford. He said, being challenged in life is inevitable. Being defeated is optional. So I decided, John Berger, to give it one more try. And then I created something into a series of actions. I call the six R's. Reflect. Remove, regroup, reinvest, restart, and rise. Reflect, I had to think about what happened, and then remove it mentally. And if I discovered, if I kept reflecting on the challenge, I could not control until I removed most of my energy from it. This allowed me to divert energy into regrouping, which is healing, and allowed me to take a step back. To see what the actual challenges are. Once I discovered what the actual challenges are, in this case, it was the word domestic violence that was supposed to trick work for me. And my dissertation, I discovered a way to move forward. So I had to reinvent myself by spending time on finding alternatives, by transforming this huge challenge in, into an opportunity to be uncomfortably innovative. I did some additional research and discovered the word interpersonal workplace violence was domestic violence when it entered into the workplace. So all I did was take out the word domestic violence, put it in a personal workplace of violence, and added 10 pages. My mental committee approved it, sent it back up to the dean. The academic dean approved my proposal two weeks later, which was the restart. Notice, the restart did not start 
until I got past the challenge that stopped it. In this case, it was the academic thing. Once I restarted, I rolled above the challenge and moved forward. Which brings me to an observation. If all I see is challenges up close, I will never see the opportunities behind it. Which brings us to win race point number two. Here's the six hours again. Reflect, remove, regroup, reinvest, restart, and rise. Was a, a year of mountaintops and valleys. I was the first sergeant at the 433rd Airway in Air Jordan. Um, I got stepped from over the senior, or wing, four air force, air force, third command, first one of the year. One of Alpha Airmen got stepped from over to master, another airman earned the wing airman of the year award, and the unit earned the tenant unit of the year award. And all of this happened in February 2014. Yes, we were high up on the mountaintop, and all of a sudden that changed. We had an airman's father-in-law who was retired. An Air Force veteran died in March on the UK weekend. Um, one of our Airmen's son, who was in the Navy, died in April. One Airman died from an illness illness more than a thousand miles away in Georgia in May. So we had back to back to back events. Um, in which the members of the unit, including my command and I, drove out that more than a thousand miles to perform major parts of the funeral service and coordinated funeral services at the 4th Airway as well. Uh, and while the May, I was driving to Georgia with my command and the car chief or I almost fell asleep. And the good thing my state trooper training kicked in and got the people back on the road. The whole time my commander did not scream. And I said, sir, you didn't say anything. You were quiet the whole time. He said, I wanted to see what the ending was going to be. And I said, I was watching that too. <laughs> So we switched driving every 30 minutes because we were so tired, but I had to get to Georgia. This was my second trip to Georgia. I drove from Texas, Texas to Georgia, leaving at 9.31 night Thursday to go see how Tech Sergeant Angela Steele was doing. And when I walked in, she was sitting at the end of the day. We laughed, we talked, we had a good time. Her family came in. And it was just so nice. I thought in my mind, everything was going to be all right. We released her a couple of days later. So I spent the night at my sister's house, left off the next day. I didn't tell her I was going to spend 16 hours in Georgia and head back. I got to the south of Mobile, Alabama, when the phone rang. It was Angela Fieger's mom. And she said, So it said, Angela passed last night. When I called my commander, he was in shock. The unit was in total disbelief. Uh, well, we had support from the wing commander on down including the spouses, friends, and family, not only from our unit, but from the entire base as well. Everyone started pulling together with 
with the single focus of making Tucson Speaks Memorial the best that it could be. It wasn't easy. We were away from our top for the first two months and in the valley for at least four months. Those UTA weekends, I can remember, I wore my blues more than I wore my other blues. It was a strong being strong for everyone. At the same time, what I am grateful my wife Jennifer was strong for me. Um, I didn't ask myself what was going to be next because I did not want a chance to get the answer I didn't like. Uh, later on that year, uh, it turned out to be uneventful and went on, but 2014 was a, uh, a year of ups and downs. My observation of charity was this. Life has its mountaintops and valleys, which bring me to one place point number three. Celebrate on mountaintops and push through valleys together. Celebrate on the mountaintops and push through valleys together. Look at that picture there. That was me. I was 170, 70 pounds. My height, I was a lean, mean control machine. Now today, there's a struggle to hold it in. So that's why I had the young ribbon guy come and take a picture. And I'm like, hurry up, hurry up. And so I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> um, I left that to do me in 1989 to become a Maryland State Cooper. But when Maryland State Police kept pushing the academy back, I became a South Carolina Hopper Patrol. Patrol. And that was my graduation um, I was in the reserve and a single parent. Um, it was tough, but I had a good support system that would help me take care of myself. A form would always try to wait up for me when I worked the 3 to 11 shift. And when I came home and he stayed up, I would talk to him for a while, read him a story. He would go back to sleep. One night, after three months of being clear about my train officer, to ride by myself, I got behind a slow moving vehicle that crossed the center line several times. I thought this would be like any other traffic stop. I would put the blue lights on this hill. He or she would pull over, and I would solidify the public relation by giving a warning, a ticket, or ensure some lucky violator redeemed his or her points for the South Carolina Jail Awards program. I activate my blue lights, and the driver did not speed up, nor did they slow down with you. But, I said to myself, they are probably going to look for a safe spot to pull over. The people do that, right? Uh, but this person kept on with that several stop. They just kept on. So, well, um, I had to make my sorry. They kept on. Uh, they didn't speed up. I was getting back off the back. But, when the right turn signal came on, I knew it was a mail gun. The vehicle slowed down, turned the back of the yard, pulled very close to the back porch. When I got out to approach the vehicle, he got out quickly and stood up on the porch. And I did not make him any impression. I said, B5 phone, what means though? Did you fall? Because that guy was three inches taller than I was, and about 50 pounds heavy. But he was nice and polite. I asked him for my life restoration. He provided me everything I asked for. And 
I told him I stopped them, and as we talked, I smelled alcohol on his breath. And then um, I did a couple of field tests, and he fell off. When I asked him how much he had to drink, he said those two magic words that would make a statement of spice entertainment. He said, I had two minutes. <laughs> And uh, when I told him he was under arrest for DUI, he said, since I made it home, I wasn't going to jail. And he told me to leave his property. Um, I thought about letting him go. And I said, uh, I thought about it. And then I thought about something my favorite officer said. He said, there, there will always be a moment or one moment that will define you as a statement. And the word will spread, whatever it is. So I said, uh, you're on the road. And he said, like, oh, no. he said, what? You talking to me? And then he did, like, that guy on, on Batman, he obeyed, he turned that switch, and as he went to the dreaming store or something, and he got three inches taller, and he's got bigger. He said, listen, boy, he said, oh, I'm going to go in the house right now, and you want to get back to your car. And I thought about it, and I deep down the side, I was scared. I'm telling you all the truth, I was scared. But I said, uh, I said with my strongest voice, I said, if you get to arrest me, you're on the arrest. And he said, look, I got a shotgun in the kitchen behind this back door because he had already opened the door. He said, if you don't leave, leave this property, I'm going to take this shotgun and I'm going to shoot you. So he thought he had people when they dressed like that all the time. But when he opened the door, behind that kitchen door, I saw that double barrel shot and he grabbed it quick. So I thought about drawing my weapon, but didn't want a chance of being shot in the process. I thought about getting his shotgun barrel in the air with my left hand in attempt to draw my weapon with my right hand to get off a shot. But we were moving too quickly and that would have been risky. We were very close. So I had no choice but to jump on him like an octopus on a clam. It allowed him to put the gun straight up in the air because I had my arms and everything around him like this. And he tried to pull the trigger several times with me on the back, on his back, but he couldn't do it. And I had him wrapped up. And I thought about, okay, if I shoot him in the back, it may be risky at the wrong time because we're moving around again. And then I end up being on the ground. While I was on the back, on his back, he ran me into one wall. And then I looked down, I saw a picture of his daughter on the counter. Now somebody would probably think right now, hey, why you just shoot it? It's one thing to talk about doing it, it's another thing to actually do. Um, he, he ran into one wall. And then he ran me into another wall. He started running me into every wall in the kitchen and in the hallway. I got home because I realized not only was I fighting for my life, I was also fighting for his life. He ran me into one wall so hard, I thought I was going to pass out. And I released my grip a little bit. Sensing it, he said, I've got you now. 
It's all over, and it was, until he made one mistake. He ran me into a wall where there were kitchen pots and pans hanging up, and I prayed an iron skillet, a small one, on my way to my next wall in country. And played Captain America. <laughs> when he was down, I drove him out, drove him out of the house, just as the cavalry came, because someone called. My uniform was all torn up. Then I came home, and I sat in the car for a minute, trying to get myself together. Um, I know if I walked in the house looking like I was looking at um, he was going to ask a whole bunch of questions. Then he would start worrying every time I went out. So I didn't want to speak to him then because I was still trying to process what happened. I had to get creative. Changed out of my uniform what was left of it. And I put on my highway patrol physical training kit. And I put the long sleeves on to hide my cuts and bruises. I was sore all over. I came to the door, stuck my chin in, and I sat there for a minute. Took a deep breath, walked in, the babysitter left the same time I came in, and there was my son sitting up on the bed. He said, Dad, you gonna read me a story? In my mind, the only thing I wanted to do was get in a bath full of ice and exercise. I came in, stepped out, read him a story. And when he fell back to sleep, I went back to bed. Acting like I was going to sleep. There's no kid in sport. So he, so my life was a wall. I didn't have to risk him getting up, walking and catching me into bed. So when I knew he was asleep, I got back out of bed. And I went to talk. And so. The next day, I went back to work. There was a sergeant, corporal, and a few troopers. They took me out to eat at a place called an iron skillet. <laughs> and here's how these people put up an event shield to protect the ones they love while they are getting themselves together. Which brings you to one great point number four. You have to eventually communicate what happened. Eventually communicate what happened, no matter how bad it is. I told my son a year or two later what happened.
So um, six years later, when they started building the the uh, HOA, they wanted officers to be involved in the process. I decided that I'm going to throw my name in there. Now, my philosophy is something temporary. We thought that, you know, because our experience would happen to us earlier, we were not going to get involved. But our principle was to have input. Have input in the process of what we're spending money. So I decided to throw my name in there. And when I did, I wanted to be a non-voting board member. We had five people up there put their name in for various offices and everybody gave a speech. And when everybody gave a speech, everyone was on. I was elected president. And that took me by surprise because I didn't even think that I had a chance. It was my perception of how I see myself or what they told me almost disqualified me from a job I was more qualified for. I rose above that challenge, had the all work together, and we did so many improvements in that community. That was the mayors and everything. And here's what I discovered in that situation, learning about myself and talking to other people in similar situations. We can be a white banana in the middle of one moment and a rotten banana in the mirror in another moment. It all depends on what we are uncomfortably striving for. So holding on to our principles instead of our philosophies often makes the difference of reaching our full potential or just falling short. You may ask yourself, what does this have to do with the importance of reintegration? Everything. When families reintegrate, they try to make everything like it was. Why do that when there's opportunities to make it better? Observation, when philosophies override principles, what's left are potentials. Which brings me to race point number five. Philosophies should not override principles. Philosophies should not override principles. In conclusion, there will always be challenges. Some challenges will cause us to falter, and some will rise above in this race called life. Each of us have challenges like someone else's, or they can be specifically designed for us. No matter what challenge encounter, do your best to rise above it. Here are the five points that may help. The point interchange everyone associated. When race point number one, it's all right to change, but don't disengage. If all we see is challenges up close, we will never see the opportunities behind it. Take time to do race point number two, and remember six R's. Reflect, remove, regroup, reinvest, restart, and then rise. Life will have its mountains, which represent successes, and valleys, which represent challenges. Remember when race point three, celebrate on the mountaintops and push through the valleys together. Sometimes people put up an event shield to protect the ones they love while they are getting themselves together. But remember when race point number four, eventually communicate 
What happens? Philosophies of temporal viewpoints shaped often by negative events, it could limit us from moving forward to grasp opportunities. However, principles are long-term, fundamental proofs on a system of beliefs and values. Principles often allow us to move forward and take advantage of opportunities despite current circumstances. Remember one great point number five. Philosophies should not override principles. Serving this great nation requires much sacrifice and perseverance. That is what makes everyone in this audience special. Don't believe differently. Challenges don't come every day in this race called life. But when it does, remember race. Rise above challenges every day. Thank you very much.